And the podcast begins with a song of rebellion. How can this podcast be my life? CD burners. We're good. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. Let's do it. Don't fucking move, dude. All right, everybody. Welcome to CD burners. Today, we have the man himself, Gabe Saporta. I got some schmutz in my pants over here. What's going on? Gabe, we, we have this like running bit that we, <laughs> you, you're everywhere. Like we, every album we've done, it's all roads lead back to Gabe. Fuck, shit. that's such a good line too. Uh, <clears throat> in case you guys missed that, because TJ's uh, chord broke, all roads lead back to me. Oh, oh. it's true. Like really? every, yeah, dude, oh, so every, like almost every album or at least good album that we review. Oh. Or like, it's not a review show, but what we talk about almost every like perfect one that we're like yeah somehow you were involved or knew somebody i have this new conjecture that i came up with this morning and that is that you're the forrest gump of music (laughs) that's actually pretty good (laughs) like you're everywhere like you're somehow at the root of everything like tracing it back to you know you and your brother putting on these shows in new jersey to being on the through being cool album cover to getting newfound glory signed to i even heard a rumor that you gave justin bieber his first yellow hood or his first purple hoodie yeah yeah yeah. Um, how'd you hear that rumor that's actually a true story did justin bieber's first purple hoodie well no time out i did not give it to him we played a show with him and i was wearing a purple hoodie we played as a small radio show. I did not give him my purple hoodie that I know of. Maybe Doesn't matter, dude. But you yeah, did. maybe I did. Yeah, you but did. F- but for sure, it was after that. You inspired rapper, it. Purple hoodie. Yeah. Dude, I mean, it's like the then, smiley face. But on then the he took count. us on tour. It's like a thank you, you know. Sick. So it was pretty good. Here's the thing: our memories are, you know, they exist in our, in our. Wow, not, that was wild. I don't know if everyone heard that at home, but that was like so intense. It's part of the show. It's like it's part, part of the, the charm okay. now. Yeah. I like it. I felt like my whole body quaking like that too. <laughs> I, re- I, re- I like, I don't know. I saw some like inspira- some dumb inspirational thing today that was like, oh wow, this is so right. And it's like, uh, you know, we can't really trust our memories. So because they're, wow. uh, they're all, they're uh, the way that we think about things and the way that we feel about things are so different than they actually are. It's like, you know, like nostalgia. So you know what? You did give it to him. <laughs> okay, and, and to him. <laughs> like that, exi- that can be real. Can the only real. thing that that the only thing that's fake now is what we're living, or what's not real is the moment that we are actually living in, dude. No, I mean, I was just very lucky. I mean, I, 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 I still am, but you know, especially as a young kid, I was just so passionate about music, and I just really loved shows, and I just wanted to be at a show every night. That was my dream. Like I would sneak out of my house take the bus to New York city and go to a show like all the time. Um, and I just loved it. And I, and I, I would like, I was the annoying kid that would sneak backstage to like talk to my favorite artists. I would pretend that I had a zine just to interview artists just because I wanted to pick their brain. Like, um, and I was really lucky. I got to like learn a lot and be around great people. And you know, it's, it's, it's been awesome. It's so sick. How many different lives and chapters you have led. Yeah, and that's true. Today we're talking about the Cobra Starship chapter. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically, we're talking about the album Viva La Cobra. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wore my purple, like the little updated, no hood, but just like a little purple for you. Where's the bling? What happened to that? I got bling? a little bling. It's just a little more just taste. You, I'm you a dad took your now. face off of it. I though? took my face off. Is that yeah. too much? You know, there was some, I saw. It's it, like, you know, I, I try and read Red, like go on Reddit. Oh and, man, I've never. I, I, I'm so. I've dude, never gone on Reddit to read myself. I'm so scared to do that. Here's the thing. You. Uh, it's. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's oh actually, I have a, I have a couple quotes that I pulled from Reddit. Okay, good. That are really good. Definitely a, a good thing. But one of the, I remember reading, it was like, I don't know why he chose that picture. It looks like a <laughs> mug shot. Like, I don't know what happened. I remember they sold it as merch I'll tell for you a story. second. I'll tell you the story. So here's the story. So the story is I used to wear a gold chain with Justin Timberlake on it. It was that, that was the chain. It was a chain that I just wear all the time with Justin Timberlake. And where did I even get that chain from? I was in LA. I was in LA on tour and I just bought like in like a flea market. I, I don't remember even exactly where I got it. Maybe I traded someone for it. I can't remember where I got it, but I'm just like, Oh, this is so perfect to have this like teen bop picture of Justin Timberlake. You know, when, when the whole idea of Cobra Starship is I wanted to be the punk rock Justin Timberlake. That was like the impetus for Cobras. Um, I'm like, great. I'm just going to wear like my inspiration around my neck. And everyone thought it was so funny. And like at that time too, it was like, it was like kind of like ironically cool to like Justin Timberlake. It was actually, Justin Timberlake was going through like a cool era. Like, I don't know, like, like if you were like a hipster kid, you're like, oh, that fucking first Justin Timberlake record fucks. Like it was a good record. People liked it. And then Pete was like, dude, it should just be you on the cover of the album 
And instead of Justin Timberlake, it should be your face. I'm like, oh, amazing. And this was before we were really good at editing stuff on the computer. So it looks like a terrible photo, like a mugshot there. Yeah, that was, a, it is a really interesting, you said that, um, you are know, like tongue, you know, tongue in cheek. And like, it was, you guys see, you've always seemed very, very self-aware and ahead of what is going to be cool. Oh, thank you. I, well, look, dude, I have a. I never tell you this stuff when I see you because I don't want to gas you up. But you know, this is this show is about you. Oh. I feel like you've called you've called so much music history that I don't even know if the people that are are listening are aware about. Which we'll oh, go we'll go into. Cry. Okay. I, I mean, you have to think that way. I I think I am like I I look at emo night and I'm like we did that we did that like I'm ever, I always wonder if people that are like so influ so influential ever go to bed and they're like if the reason that exists is because of me that's an amazing amazing observation because when i first got into music i saw that happen and there was like a, there's like a history of that a little bit in the music business like you know um even like gorilla biscuits sang about that of like the older bands weren't psyched when the new newer bands came in right and i remember that in the back of my head and i remember when midtown started it was kind of new it was like midtown newfound saves a day it was, you know, it was really, we were kind of combining pop punk and emo. It was like the second generation after a lifetime. And it was like, yeah, it was a younger version of it, a little bit more commercial, you know, and that I think opened the doors to major labels getting excited about it. And then Midtown, for whatever reason, didn't, didn't work, right? Some of the other bands worked, Midtown didn't work. And I saw a lot of other bands. I remember thinking like, oh, they're driving down this highway that we helped pave and we're not getting the benefits from that. I very clearly remember just like making a choice. It's like, okay, I have a choice to become bitter about this and become one of these old bands that like Gorilla Biscuits is literally singing about yeah. that like is, is mad at the young kids or I can just embrace it and be like, cool. Like, I'm just going to be a part of it, even though it didn't work out for me. I'm just, you know, I'm not going to get bitter about it because I saw even in, even in the local Jersey scene, I saw some of the older bands that were like, oh, we've been around for five years and we're not big yet. And they would like end up drinking at the bar and just complaining, you know? And I just like, I was like, okay, I'm not going to be a victim about this. I'm not going to be a complainer. I'm just going to have fun with it and like really get out of my own way. Right. Because that's really the point of Cobra Starship is like, okay, I'm just going to try and be as big as possible. And I'm going to be self-aware about it and be tongue in cheek about it so that people that are in on the joke with me know that what I'm doing. Um, but I'm also, I don't want to be bitter about not being able to make a living doing what I love, which is music. Well, I mean, we can just look at, you know, when things like that happen for us, I go, good. I'm happy that this is happening in music, right? Like I'm yeah. happy that, you know, at least I can go to bed knowing that I move the needle a tiny like bit. Like what's an example of that that you've seen? I mean, what festival <clears throat> did you just play? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Interesting. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 we it. kind of felt like, oh, we, we were carrying the torch uh -huh. for like 10 years mm -hmm. and oh, it wasn't cool for a long time. Mm -hmm. And we kind of like turned it around and made it cool mm -hmm. for a second. And then, you know, some people decided to cash in on that. <laughs> yeah. Which is fine. It's great. It I think good. like, you know, that, that sort of thing like lifts all ships and like we've gotten so much out of it. We, we got like a Vegas residency over the past three years. Like Emo Night has, has gotten like so much bigger because of the pop cultural zeitgeist, you know, and there was a, a moment where I think we let's not be bitter about this and like understand that, you know, all of the artists and everybody that, maybe hasn't gotten paychecks like this before ever in their lives. So they're finally getting it and like they deserve it. And the fact that we got to help be a part of like bringing the scene to that place is, is worth it. That's awesome. That's yeah. a great perspective. And I think also that just comes, you know, it's a little bit, it's like that level of maturity just comes a little bit with age, you know, it's 100%. like hundred like, percent. So it's like when you're a young band, it's very hard to think that way. You know, I see it with, I work, work with young artists now and like, I get it. Like sometimes artists are just like, I live this every day, 24 seven. And it's like, you feel that because you work so hard, you should be getting something out of it. But there's, there's a big part of it that's left up to the universe. Like you don't know when it's going to happen for you. You know, the road is never like a straight road. It might be windy, but what I've just learned is you stay on it. Eventually you're just, you're going to make it. You're going to get there. You don't know how you're going to get there, but you will get there. <laughs> Dude, and you see, you, know, you said you work with a lot of young artists and I'm, and I'm like, there's a part of me that goes, I don't know if this artist would exist if we didn't, push through in 2014 for sure you know like and for that sure. and to me that's really cool like yeah. to me that that i always think look if a fucking young kid today finds midtown and it inspires because they're like 
oh, I saw fucking Lil Wayne at Emo Night, and I like that, and I'm going to see what Emo Night is. And they go, and they deep dive, and they do all this shit, and they're like, there was a band called Emo If that, if the pipeline, if that that pipeline is the uh, is the truth, then I'm happy about it. Bro, now I'm going to gas you up. I feel like a lot of kids are just like, oh, I just discovered this guy, Lil Wayne, at, at Emo Night. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, I know. To us, it's like fucking, Lil did one of the craziest crossover. Anyway. That is crazy. crazy. Cobra crazy. Starship. I, I read, I read that that was some of the bitterness that you held on to with like drive through. And that was kind of like why Midtown fell apart a little bit. Like they started yes. paying a lot of attention to newfound. Wow. You really did your research. I, yeah, I did. It's weird when your friends <laughs> research you. I'm just like, okay, yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. That is true. I get it from both sides. It matters from my perspective. I'm a young, I'm a young kid, like taking a chance with, with, you know, a label that I really consider my friends signing with them, not talking to any other labels, find other bands for them, find a band for them. And then I feel like, hey, they don't have time for me because they're paying attention to this band that's taken off more for them. Which at the end of the day, like you're right, rising, you know, I, I wasn't mature enough then to know that like, hey, it's going to be good for me if I just wait my turn. Like, okay, maybe they're focused on this now, but like, it's going to be good for everybody. But um, yeah, I, I, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. I have a, I've told this story before on, on probably on this podcast. And, and just for the record, I've made up with Richard and Stephanie from Drethus and since, so Richard, Stephanie, love you guys. Well, Sorry actually then never, I'm not going to tell this story. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I just, I, I want to keep it positive with everybody. That's really, you know, it's like, like, you know, it's not a, like, ne you know. it's not, it's not truly a negative experience. I basically like, you know, I, it was, uh, my, my band from Tucson got asked to come to drive through when I was like 15. And so we show up and play the stuff and Richard's like, Oh, it's between like, you know, and I've never been into like a record label before. I've never been to like a merch warehouse. Like all of it's, it's truly I didn't know you got courted by drive through. That's crazy. And he was like, do you want to hear this other band that we like might sign, you know, instead he was, at least they were honest about it. And it was uh, something corporate. No way. Yeah. And I was like, thank God that they did that. That's crazy, yeah. bro. That's Isn't crazy. That yeah, that's wild. So yeah. speaking of the different chapters uh -huh. that you've lived in your life, I read this fucking wild story that you uh made your living off of playing poker where are you reading this stuff yeah that's 100 percent true how like how did that happen what was that i don't want to say i made my living i mean playing poker but you were like paying I, was, your rent. I was paying my rent i was surviving okay so after after midtown basically when midtown happened we signed a deal and we each got like 30k i think from our signing you know like so you know, I don't know what everyone did with their money. And that's a big deal for being how old you were. Like, and yeah, at the time, like, like that's fucking a lot of money. I was like 22. It's 20, a lot of money. It's a lot of money for, yeah, for, for, you know, and I just, um, you know, I didn't use it as living money. I, I bought a house, my first house when I was 23. So, and it was like in the hood. I like, I remember I got jumped my first week that I was there <laughs> like a year later when I started Cobras, Nate from Cobras drove up and stayed in that house. He drove his car from Atlanta, Georgia that night, all his car got jacked. All his wheels were gone. Everything like it, it ended up in cinder blocks on the other side of town uh, someplace. And that, that area has since become a very nice area, but I was early to that area. It's Jersey city. I mean, for anyone who's from Jersey and knows it like Jersey city is now like a hop in a spot. Yeah. So I bought a house. I didn't have any cash. So I just had my house. Um, so I needed to like have money to pay my mortgage, pay food. So I would play in underground poker clubs. Are you going to be playing poker in Vegas? Next I did week? last year. Last year I played poker. Karina, remember I, last year I won, I won like a hundred bucks last year and I was really wasted. I, I'm really good at playing wasted because everyone thinks like I come in really obnoxiously, like you can imagine. And like all the, all the professional players at the table are like, Oh, this guy, I'm going to take all his money. And then I fuck him so bad. <laughs> like I'm, I'm actually really good. I'm a really good poker player oh, so yeah. much. Cause I'm, I mean, like when you play enough poker that you do the math in your head really quick. And then it's all about, I, I love poker because it's like the only thing that separates me and you is just two cards, right? We're all playing the same five cards there. You're, no one has an advantage over the other person. The only advantage is psychology, right? It's like how you present yourself, what you're making the other person think, reading the other person, you know? And it's like, and if you are in a moment, it's just like playing, like going on stage. Like if you're in a moment of clarity, you can go on stage and have a great show. If something's like holding you back or you're bothered about something, like you're going to do bad, you know? So, um, so it's really interesting. So I was always very, especially when I was playing early in the early days, I would play at this club called, it doesn't exist anymore. It's called the Genoa club, but it was underground. So like you had to like know someone, they were all mafia run clubs. Like the dealer at the place had no fingers. Like it was, it was, it was interesting, interesting time, but it was fun. Dude, I just bring it back a little bit, a little bit into the music stuff. I've said this on here a, a, another billion. I reference 
you all the time for a lot of stuff because I truly believe that like mid Midtown was the, uh, like when I, I heard it, I was like, Oh, this is it. Like that was like, this is, this is the, you did everything in Midtown that I would want in a, in a band. You know, like Thank you. the best, the best harmony in since sitting, no, nobody had, I don't think anybody's, uh, come close to the, the Midtown, the Midtown harmonies and the, the core, like it just, it sounded like something that I wanted to do as I'm never able to like write that stuff. And you can tell actually in some of the Cobra stuff where it comes from. But when you started, you know, cause you came, came from a lot of hard, hard stuff. And then like, like say his day it, at the time wasn't as pops. I don't think it had as much pop sensibility and all the bands didn't have as much pop sensibility. When you started Midtown, was that the, you're like, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do this right. No, I didn't really have like, it's weird. I didn't have that much of a plan with Midtown. I think we were definitely like inspired. Like e- e- there was something going on in hardcore at the time that there was a lot of melodies being infused, like, and multiple singers, like hot water music was like a big inspiration we were listening to at the time. And like, they had a lot of like some of their songs, like the, the recordings are like really raw. They scream a lot of time. But if you really like, if you were to redo those songs with like, beautiful singers. So it's like beautiful melodies, amazing, amazing melodies. So, you know, so we had that aspect. And then we also like, you know, as kids, when we were like, when I was like, when I was eight, the first record I bought was like Bon Jovi's New Jersey, you know? So, and this is when I was living in Queens and we were moving to New Jersey. I was like so excited to move to New Jersey because uh, that was my favorite record. So like I had like this like thing of like, oh, I'm, you know, like this like influence of like this hair metal, very slick harmonies, guitar harmonies, solos, you know? So I had that kind of like in me. And I think all of us did, you know, me, Tyler Heath, especially, he was like a big hair metal guy, you know? Um, so we kind of brought that in a little bit, you know, and we had the multiple singers, multiple singers were already happening. Um, and also the real premise of it was that here's what happened. I was in a band before Midtown called Humble Beginnings, um, very apropos name. Um, and I got kicked out of that band and I was like, fuck, if I don't want to get kicked out of a band again, I better learn to sing. So then I'm like, okay, let's just do a band where we all get to sing. Tyler was already the same. Tyler and Heath were in a band together called Nowhere Fast. And Heath was already doing backups with Tyler. I'm like, let's just all sing songs together. It's all right. Let's all sing. Let's all do parts. It's, you know, like, and it was really more about like having a collective kind of democracy approach to it more than just like, you know, uh, thinking of it as a boy band thing. I mean, hey, look, it's it, the, the albums that Midtown did have been, some of them, they're, you know, it's like for me at least in the, in the, the top 10 of all time. Oh, I also think that you, we, should we just hold hands the whole interview? I think that you, I, <laughs> dude, I, I, you all, you've been part of like so many things that I love, like Thank so you. many things that I, I like really love. Anyway, I don't talk about that. We got to talk about Cobra. So okay. <laughs> you were playing in Midtown. It was much more of like a democracy. It was like, we're going to play songs together as friends. Midtown ends you're like, oh, should I go back to school? What should I do here? You start Cobra. It starts off as a solo project. W- what was that shift like for you? And then, you know, how how did it grow kind of from a solo project to like, hey, I'm going to do this thing with my friends. You're bringing in like William, you're bringing in uh, the, the lady from the sounds. And, you know, and then it becomes this like whole outfit of like pop people. But at the end of the day, like Cobra was a solo project and in many ways it like kind of still is like, what was that, that shift like for you? Um, I think it was hard in many ways. I mean, there were a lot of things that brought me to that point and it might be like too long to get into it in this interview. I mean, stop me from start rambling. So, but there were like several things. Um, you know, I guess the first thing is that when we started Midtown, this democracy, like we were in college, right? I was like, I was like, dude, I'm just going to go to school. Cause I, before I went to college, I took a year off to tour with humble beginnings. And I was like, cool. I love this. Let me tour and do this. And I got kicked out of the band. I'm like, fuck it, dude. I'm just going to do literally my idea was like, I'm going to do music as a hobby. I'm going to go to school, get a degree. And you know, I'm just going to have this amazing passion project. That's for fun, for fun with my friends. I love it. No agenda. And then it just started doing really well. You know, it's almost like after Humble Beginnings, I didn't skip a beat. And like everyone locally in Jersey knew about Midtown and it just became bigger than, than any of our bands were before. It was like the power of numbers coming together. Or this, what's that? The sum total is greater than some of its parts. Is that the expression? Yeah, whatever. Right. Anyway, so Midtown was bigger than any of our bands had been before. Um, then we were touring 
uh, you know, Nashville, then we got signed to drive through and, and drive through became a thing. And it just like all of a sudden, like, you know, I was still in school and the summer of my, uh, of my freshman year, we're on tour with Blink-182, right? So I was like, holy shit, you know? And then like this whole business world opened up to me because, you know, it's like, it's different when you're in LA, you know, people are just like, you're kind of like around the business. But when you're a suburban kid from Jersey, you know, you have no idea that there's something called a music business or what it is. So all of a sudden I get introduced to the business and I really think of it as like, okay, this is like a viable lane, you know, that it could be serious. So I, I really, I felt like, I started taking it really seriously um, and maybe more so than, you know, not everyone was taking it as seriously as me in that respect. So then that kind of uh, democracy thing doesn't work as well. And then I watched this interview with um, the police, like a, a documentary on the police and they're interviewing all the guys and, you know, Stuart Copeland is there. He's got a big attitude and stuff at the police and Sting, you know, after, after the police, Sting became bigger than the police solo, right? And Sting goes, yeah, you know, democracy is an amazing thing in, uh, for government, but I'm not so sure it's good for art. <laughs> <laughs> and that just always resonated with him. Like, okay, you know, it's like if you have a vision as an artist, sometimes it's hard to want to listen to what someone else has to say. And that could be selfish, but it's also like your vision. You're an artist. You're coming up with something like, I don't necessarily want to check it with anybody else. That made sometimes. me feel insane how right that is. Yeah. So it's 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 a hard That's thing. That's crazy. And it's and it's and and it was hard because by the way, I love I, I mean the guys from Midtown are like my brothers, you know, to this day. And it's like there's something special that can't be replaced. Like when you're growing up with someone, you start something when like you're a teenager and you do it together. It's like it's almost like when when I see them, it's like more meaningful than my actual high school reunion, you know? So we get together with Midtown, we're trying to just do once a year one show in Jersey, like a hometown reunion show. And that's really meaningful, you know, but for me, I really wanted to have a business. I had a vision. And then the third element is what I was saying before about, you know, that you have to choose to not be bitter. So it started happening that a couple of the guys in Midtown did start getting bitter towards mm. the end, you know, and I, I, I've talked about this in another interview, but for me, there's like a very, I think I talked about this in, in the, in the drunk history I did with Pete um, that never came out. Maybe we should put that out on emo night. We have pieces of it. We have to release it. But, but basically there was, there was kind of like a, a, a watershed moment in the history of Midtown where it was at the end of the Fall Boy tour. And that tour is very strange for us because, you know, Fall Boy were signed to the same management company. And again, that's a band when they signed to crush Midtown was bigger within a year, Fall Boy was bigger. Right. So it's hard for a band to see that. I mean, it's happened to other bands. I know bands that it's happened to, and they like, they get shell shocked from that and they never recover. Right. It's happened with, Panic at Disco and other bands. Like I've seen it a bunch of times. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, I'm not going to, I'm going to be stoked about this. Like to me, it was actually inspiring. Like I, that tour to me was inspiring because I'm like, okay, here's Fall Out Boy. They're not that much younger than me. They're four years younger than me. I mean, Pete was my age, but the other guys were like three or four years younger than me. Right. And I'm like, they're where I was four years ago. Like, and I have now seen too much. I'm getting a little jaded, but like being around them is inspiring me to not be jaded and just to like be into music for the reasons I wanted to be in the first place. That's awesome. I want to be around this more, you know? And some of the other guys didn't feel that as much. And there was a moment at the last show of that tour, you know, at the end of the tour, you do like tour pranks and stuff. You got mm -hmm. in trouble. You got in trouble? Yeah. What'd you well, do? Wait, wait, wait. We've oh, talked sorry. about this before. Uh, Cause I was like, oh yeah, this, that, that's why Midtown broke up. But I want to hear you tell the yep. story. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't want to repeat myself. I've said it before, but but basically, Fall Boy came at the end of the the, the Midtown set and caked us. They just got huge yeah. bags of flour and threw it all over us, you know. And you know, we all were like ghosts and white. And I thought it was hilarious. And not everyone thought it was hilarious. Some people got really upset, you know. And that was kind of like to me, that was the, like the end of Midtown. I was yeah. like, okay, you guys are like going here, I'm going there. Um, and we kind of like, I think we had like one small headline run after that. And then we never played a show again. And that was it, you know? And yeah. then I went, I, I rented a cabin um, that summer and, and um, not the Pokemon, the Catskills. And I wrote the first cover record. I think that was called antiquing, right? Antiquing, they used to do it on that's Jackass. what it's called. Yes, yes, yeah. it's called antiquing. Yeah, that's what I got was. in trouble for that before, like it? in high school. Like, I, and it got all over like some kid's kitchen on yeah. New Year's. Some fucking asshole. Yeah, we got in trouble for one yeah, of the end of the tour end prank. of the tour pranks. Even though that was like our first like tour. I used to do a lot of pranks as a kid, and my <laughs> my friends' parents hated me because they always had to clean it up. <laughs> I mean, okay, just, I'll tell the story that probably won't get get us in trouble, but we. Um, you know, we went on, on a bus tour with 303 
And when? 2018. Wow. Yeah. It was for wild. The, dude, it was for the 10 year of want. And now we're in the 10 year of emo night. That's crazy, bro. And uh, we just, uh, you know, our visuals, we just put a picture of uh, Sean in our visuals at the end <laughs> uh, at the, of the night. And he was. But like shirtless, like he didn't like mirror that. selfie. No, no, he didn't like it. Oh my god! <laughs> but it's it is good. Just one night or every night? Just on like the, the last night, second to last Dude, night. Because yeah. we didn't want to do it in their hometown. We did it in like Omaha. Yeah, yeah which was but... respectful to not do <laughs> yeah. in the last night. Can I? Okay, so you are a technical question, right? Like, sure. so you have been in bands, bands mm-hmm. before before Cobra Starship. Mm-hmm. Going into Cobra Starship, it's synth and it's pop how did you write that as opposed to did you normally just write with with guitars or were you working keyboards like how how does someone make the switch to do that great question so on the last midtown record i bought a program called reason which at the time people were using so in the midtown record there's a bunch of like interludes that are programmed i did those so i was starting to like learn about programming and like you know, making music in the computer. So one of the premises that I did for Cobra Starship is I want to start with the beat and then build after that, you know? And I think a lot of people do that now, but at the time it was like, you know, you always like start a song playing guitar and singing. That's how I wrote every single Midtown song. So with Cobras, I'm like, I'm just going to start a beat and then build on top of that. So like Snakes on a Plane, for example, which, you know, initially wasn't that, it was, it was called Bring It and it had, it just had that. And then I started with the bass on them. And that's what I recorded at the top. You know, and then I put the guitars on top afterwards. So, yeah, it was just a different, I, I want to try a different approach because I felt like it would open me up to to write a different, uh, expand the styles I could do. I'm not familiar, I'm like not familiar with Reason, but was there like, at the time was like their MIDI? Yeah. There, there was, was but I wasn't using it. You know, I was doing everything like on the computer. There wasn't like a separate keyboard that I had. Um, I was like, it was like, I think I might have even been using like a separate four track on top of that. Uh, no, it was, in, it was in the computer somehow. I don't know what I was using. Because Reason, I don't think you re- could record audio. It was just no. programming. Yeah. yeah. I read that you guys uh, recorded a lot of this out, or at least I like, wrote a lot of these songs on the bus while yes. you were on tour together. And like yes. at this point, you had you had different band members and stuff, uh-huh. and you guys were all like kind of like p- passing hard drives and like adding their parts and things. Is that? Well, yeah. I mean, this record was really, uh, you know, because it's the first Cobra record I did all myself. Um and then, and then I had some producers that I worked with, uh, Sam and Sluggo, who like became like the producers at that time, did a lot of the stuff, gym class, us, academy. Um, and then for, we wanted to like, put a record out right away. We put out that record, went on tour, toured the whole year. And within one year, we had a second record out. Um, so it moved very fast. And that record was interesting because we were on tour with Fall Out Boy, I think like two or three times that year. And me and Patrick wrote a lot of that record together. Like I remember like on tour and we had like a couple of days off in Chicago. I stayed at Patrick's house and he like had to go like see his family. And he like left me in his house to just like work on lyrics. And like, that's where I did Cities at War, you know? So nice. cool. That song's sick. Yeah. Patrick. When you like same, same sort of deal. Like when you were writing that on the bus, how, how do you guys, it was it in reason Were you guys? No, by then we were doing other programs. Um, it was Ableton and Logic by then, you know? Yeah. And then, and then actually time out. So then we had, we had the bones of that record done, right? I did a bunch of songs with Patrick. Then we did a lot of songs in our own bus by ourselves with us passing hard drives around, like sitting around doing, doing records. Dude, I remember we even recorded vocals. We did like, like we did the, I did, I kissed a boy. We did a version of that. We did that on the bus. We did a song with like stun a man that we recorded on the bus. Like, I don't even know how we we're doing that stuff back then. We'd have like, the technology wasn't as good back then that you could do it. But yeah, we were just like pushing hard and just doing stuff. I remember, I remember programming The World Has Its Shine. The like, I remember like moving the MIDI things, like drunk three in the morning <laughs> after a show, you know? Did, I mean, that's where I'm at. Like I downloaded it. I, I finally just downloaded Ableton. So I was like reading through all of this shit. And then I was like, how the fuck did this guy do this back then? And I'm like, you know, it's so, it's so much easier now. I think it was easier then. There's too much. Right now, I think, I think probably the barrier to like the learning curve was less then because it was simpler. The programs didn't, couldn't do as much, yeah. you know? So there wasn't as much to get lost in. It's just like, here's some fucking keyboard sounds. Here's the MIDI, like make here's it work. The, I remember the drum sequencer. You like uh, fucking highlight the little lights on there. That worked like the, like the Roland um, drum program. Yeah, right? which is strange because like, you know, you, 
the, some of the reviews, the reviews for this album when it came out were mainly positive. And yeah. then there were some, you know, uh, reviews that are like, it's overproduced, but that was the, it seems to be the point of the album. And I think when people say overproduced, they're just talking about sounds that they've never heard before, you know, especially in music review. I go on fucking record every single show and say the music reviewers are the fucking worst people in the entire world. I don't know. I don't know that I've ever read any of the reviews yeah. for, for, it's funny. Well, they're generally positive, like for the, and at the time, mainly positive that's good yeah. let, me, let me ask you this you put you you have cobra and you have all the people that you grew up with in new jersey going to these shows and a lot of it was hard a lot of it was like hardcore music a lot of mm -hmm. it was punk rock music when all of your friends heard cobra for the first time what was that what was the reception were they like what the, f what the fuck are you doing dude yeah i remember cody from the blood brothers i played it for him and he was like dude, what are you doing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like literally, I think that was literally what he said to me. I'm like, just like, no, man. I'm just like, because you have to understand too, at that time, like a lot of the kids that were living in New York that were like grew up going to shows, they all around the same age turned 21 and started going out at night. Mm -hmm. And New York at the time, it wasn't like going to like, you know, I don't know what kids do when they start going out at 18. They go to emo night, I guess, you know? Um, yeah, or now they, now they, now they do. They do. Yeah. Yeah, but I guess before emo night, like, you know, you would have to go to like these like bigger clubs. New York had like a unique thing. There are two things happening in New York. One, there was like an uptown downtown thing. Like this was in the wake of the strokes where you had like kind of like fancy club people hanging out with like downtown dirty rock and roll people. So there was like a good mix of stuff. So like at every club that you would go to, there were like fancy bottle clubs. There were like so many fucking cool people because all the cool people would get in for free because they knew their friends at the door. They would get free bottles and stuff and like party in like these upscale kind of clubs. Right. So that, by the way, that's a little bit of like the premise of Cobra Starship was like, Hey, mm -hmm. we're not really getting into this club. We're sneaking through the door. We got a friend that works there. It's going to get us in, you know? So like that was the vibe. The second thing that happened is there was an amazing party in New York at the time called Misshapes, which in a lot of ways is like the precursor to emo night. If, if you can, you know, no, I want to get the girls from Misshapes to come do a set at emo night. I feel like that'd be, that'd so, be fun. so sick. That yeah. would be the definitely like meeting, you know, world yeah. colliding. Yeah. But Misshapes was like, you know, they were all punk rock kids, you know, and they all like everyone that went there, DJ there, hung out was like all kids that grew up going to going to show. So that shift was already happening naturally. And it wasn't like, you have to understand, it wasn't like mainstream. It was like, they're playing like new wave records, you know, and like Blur, you know, like Depeche Mode. And like, so all those are, have influences in Cobra Starship. And I feel like it's like a mix of that plus Justin Timberlake, which again, that would get played at Misships. You would have like a Blur song and then like, you know, a Justin Timberlake song and then like Madonna was DJing, you know? So it was like these kind of meldings of worlds of like, hey, dance music, that's cool because people wanted to dance. Like that was the thing. They didn't want to necessarily, you know, people like to get together and move. Like, you know, people are like, are like looking for energy. They're looking to, 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 to like do something, express themselves when they're together, you know? And sometimes that's beating the shit out of each other. And sometimes it's just like, Getting down. I have a profound thing to say. Let's oh, hear I it. love. I love that there's an announcement every time. There's a profound thing. To say. I have a lot, dude. Yeah. I really you am should, like. Should, I, I don't know if you guys have does. this, but you guys should have like. You he know, he has a lot of profound. Things I do. To say. Morgan profound state I number seven. <laughs> I legitimately think. Okay, so you know how we are seeing a revival of indie sleaze. Sure. Yeah. That term did not exist. No, it didn't. It didn't exist. And so when you look at when you hear that. Uh, when you hear that phrase in your head, you know, what do you picture? You picture Cobra Starship. Thank like you. that is what you picture in your head. And so like, well, we've, therefore, been, we've been featured on Indie Sleaze a bunch of times. I'm talking about the term. Like oh, I you, thought, we're okay. hearing like the term, yeah, yeah, yeah. the revival of it. And yeah. like when, if you Google the term Indie Sleaze, like it didn't exist until a couple of months ago maybe a year ago mm -hmm. and so people are calling it a revival a revival of a thing that didn't actually happen it's a it's a concept based on nostalgia and the nostalgia is is what you were doing that that's what people picture in their heads when you know people are posting photos of what they're trying to emulate and and it was cobra starship so again gabe at the forefront of something that I don't even know if you knew that that was the thing. Well, does, it, is that profound? Because I think it is. I, I Karina, don't know. does that make sense? <laughs> I know what you're saying. Yeah. So I, the term didn't exist, right? Uh huh. And so when when artists started coming out now and we're seeing all this like electro pop happen, 
people are clinging to nostalgia, but they can't just say this is electropop. So they're saying the revival of something. And so what they're calling that thing is indie sleaze when really indie sleaze and the, what they are framing it as is exactly what you were doing. Yes. Yes. And no. I mean, we were doing it. I, I think that Cobra was because, I mean, we were a part of both worlds, you know, it's like yeah. misshapes is a perfect example because in misshapes, you had people that came there that came from like the hardcore world or like the underground pop punk world, whatever that, that show VFW world is. And then you had people that, that were never a part of like this, any kind of like underground scene, but like went to college and like listened to indie rock and ended up there. Right. So they didn't have so much roots in like underground music. Right. And they didn't have like the necessarily the punk part of it, the, the really like maybe the DIY principles or like those kind of ethos, but they still liked the fashion of it. Right. And both those things met in Indie Sleaze. So Indie right. Sleaze is a, is a meeting of people that are just there for the fashion and also people there that also come from like ethos. The worlds do collide there. So Cobra Starship, I think, is the bridge for the people coming from the, the underground. Because yeah. to you guys that grew up in punk rock, Cobra Starship is Indie Sleaze, right? But to other people, right. it's like, what? Cobra Starship's not a part of this, you know? It's, what, I understand it 100% because... I, I was going to ask you, like, if you ever felt like you were a little bit outside of, like, the hipster stuff. Always outside. Because it, it was, at that time in Brooklyn, there was this kind of, like, elitist thing happening with, like, the Rapture and, yes. like, all those, like, really cool, like, hipster runoff bands. And then, like, you were kind of doing electropop, but you were doing it over on our side of the scene. And, like, but you were still there. In Brooklyn, like you, you, you did feel outside and like, how did that sort of like, yes, I yes. And no, I, I guess like when I was hanging in New York, even before I had Cobra Starship, that was the world that I was in. Right. So when, as soon as I moved to New York, you know, as a 19, 20 year old kid in New York, you're kind of like automatically like in that there wasn't like a hardcore scene in New York. Like the, I feel like the, well, that's not true either. Ugh, I'm, I might have to think about this for a second. It's okay because you guys both missed my point. <laughs> it's, it's literally oh, fine. Whose fault is that? It's mine because I'm not good at explaining stuff. I'm not saying that at the time Cobra was that. I'm saying that that's in retrospect. In retro, because the term people weren't using that to describe anything yet up until six months ago. What people when people report on it now, the vision that they're trying to put in everybody's head was what Cobra was doing. Is what I'm saying. Got it. Yeah, the cobra in some way is uh, um, symbolic of that. It, but it didn't exist then, right? right and right. now, and so the thing when people are like, let's say you're writing an article and you're like, this band is indie sleaze. You're like, what does that mean? Because the term wasn't a thing. And right. so when they're posting pictures and finding stuff, all of those pictures could be any picture of you from that era. Yes. And because we were living that then, I mean, that's literally the life we're living. So that's what I'm saying. I think Indie Sleaze, Indie Sleaze really relates more to like, to me, it's like more about a vibe of like, you know, because when you think of Indie Rock, you think of like wireframe glasses and a little bit more intellectual, you know, and Indie Sleaze has this thing of like that style of music, but also like debauchery. And that is kind of what it was there. People were like, there was something about that era, you know, the, the financial crash and everything. It felt like the world was ending and people were just like, fuck it. Let's just go out with a bang. Well, that was the original name of the album, right? If the world is ending, we're throwing the party. Yeah. So yeah, it was a little, it was a bit, a bit of a mouthful, but, um, a great name. Thank you. But that, that's the big line in guilty pleasure. So, so I mean, then back to your question in terms of being outsiders. Yeah. I feel like I've been an outsider, not only in every band, but like always in my life, I've always felt like an outsider. Um, and I think that's a good thing, you know, um, I, I never felt like a hundred percent fit in anywhere, but I do, f I never felt not accepted because of that. That was kind of what I was answering your question. Like when I would hang out in places, I didn't feel like people were like, Oh, there's the Cobra Starship guy. Although what's her fucking face one, uh, one time, what's her name? Call her out. She, her, her album's called, uh, everything is embarrassing. Jamie. Sky Ferreira. Sky Ferreira. So she was like an indie darling. Yeah, she was darling. the darling. Of she was the darling. Enough. And I met her before she was really big. And she like said something and be like, aren't you fucking friends with Pete Wentz? <laughs> like that to me, like something like, like judging me. Like, so I guess once Cobra got big, people that didn't know me already from before and they were new to that world were like, why are you fucking hanging out here? Maybe a little bit. I, who, I didn't fucking care, you know, but, but most, most of the time it never felt like I'm a Libra. I, I love people. I love being around people. I'm friendly. 
if someone doesn't like me, I don't really care, you know? So I, you know, I, I like having fun. I like, and I like, I, I'm really am happy when people around me are happy. If people around me are happy, I feel happy. If they're not happy, if they're not happy, I try to help them. But then if they don't want help, I just move on to someone that's fun. Okay. I don't, I'm, I'm not going to do it. What are you Found statement I'm number done. eight. No, I'm done. <laughs> Dude, what I said before, what I, what I said before is legitimately the truth. And I guarantee somebody will, some fucking article guy will like take it and quote it. And then it's a big article and he'll say it in a way that is better than how I said it. I'm bad at that. All right. So, Gabe, something. we're catching you fresh off of rehearsals from yes for Cobra Starship for when we were young. Uh-huh. How does it feel to be playing these songs again? Number one, and two, you know, all this, all these years later, what are what are the songs that like are standing out to you as like, oh shit, this is a fun one, or like this one kind of sucks. Oh shit. Um, so first of all, it feels actually awesome, and it feels much better than I thought it was going to. I thought I was going to be like embarrassed. Um, there's a couple lines that I'm a little, like, you know, I'm a dad now. I got three kids. I'm just like, so there's a couple lines in there. I'm just like, oh, can I really say that? You know, and then um, so now we have uh, what well, the, the show will have happened already. So we have three backup singers, and uh, I feel bad they have to sing my lyrics. You know, <laughs> and they're like nice, nice young women. VIP uh, boys aren't gonna pop out. <laughs> no, they're not popping out, but. Um, but, but, uh, no, I feel great. I was actually like for the whole year, I was like, it was kind of like in the back of my head, we got to like put this together and I started working on it like top of the year. And it takes time to like rev something back up that hasn't been operational in 10 years, you know? Mm-hmm. So first of all, it's finding, um, the, our bass player and guitar player, you know? Um, I, I don't know. People, I'm, I know Cobra fans know this, but Riley and Alex didn't want to do the reunion. Why? They, you know, they didn't really give a reason. I didn't press them on it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I would love to have had them. Um, and I think fans, more than anything, w- would have loved to have had them. And um, I think that they're, like, in a different place in their lives. Um, if I were to speculate, I don't want to speak for them. And I just feel like it just didn't really make sense for them with wherever they are in their lives, you know? I get it, but I still, whatever. I, I think it, it's like you, you can set yourself aside and be like, yes, this was a great time and place. We're going to do this one thing. I, whatever. I, that's my opinion. I don't want to, I mean, that's what Pete said too. I'm just like, I'm so, you know, but I didn't want to push it. And, and, um, and you know, they're great guys. I mean, I, I, I love Ryan and Alex, both Alex actually, ironically, when I broke my finger in for the Midtown shows, he came, flew out and played Based for Midtown, which was like a definitely big nice. in the world. So, um, which I appreciate did that. But um, it's a big commitment. Also, Alex lives in New York. He'd have to fly here for rehearsals. Ryland, like I work with now as a producer on stuff and he's amazing. But again, like I, I, I get it. Like it's kind of the same reason why I said no to doing so many reunions right. and covers before when your head is like in a different place. It's like taking you out of that. It's like a big thing. And it's like, you don't want to do a bad job. You don't do half ass. Yeah. And you so, have to get there. You, like you, the, per, the person has to get to that spot in exactly. order to do it. So. So that was like haunting me in the back of my mind. I'm like, oh, am I going to be able to do this? Is it going to come off half-assed? Am I going to do it great? But like now I feel so good about it. I mean, I guess when this airs, we'll ha- the show will have come out. So maybe I'll be eating my words and we fucked up. But I feel like we're going to rock it. You know, yeah. I feel like I, I really feel like this show is kind of what I always envisioned Cobra Starship to be. You know, it's like we have now like, you know, the opportunity to just put on like a big stage, big performance, which is, you know, it's kind of like Cobras was always like larger than life in some way. Um, and we got Thrasher to play guitar, who's fucking beast. And Jake, um, how do you pronounce his last name? Mascenari? I still don't remember. Is that Mascenari? Hot Jake. We just call him Hot Jake. <laughs> oh. You know Hot Jake. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, he's hot Jake. super hot. He's super hot. Yeah. And he's great. It's like yeah. annoyingly hot. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but he's, 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 they're both like awesome dudes and it's just a great hang. Thrasher's wife is an amazing singer and her two sisters are our backup singers Sing. and they're like, you know, when you have three sisters singing together, it just oh, sounds yeah. like all one voice. It's yeah, awesome. Totally. Yeah. It's so fun. Yeah. And I kind of, you know, that <clears throat> it really does feel like what Cobra should be. Just like ridiculous. That stage, just, yeah. Like yeah. A, a little over the, like a little over the top. But tasteful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they're cool. They're punk rock chicks also, you know, but they just happen to be amazing singers. Yeah. Yeah. And you're doing it front to back. No, we're not. Actually. No, not no, front to back. Not. No, because we, we want to put in like, you know, Good Girls is in on that album, yeah, you yeah. know? So, so you know, I talked to a lot of other bands. And most bands are not doing yeah. full full album plays, especially for a band that yeah. hasn't played in 10 years. I mean, you want the hits. Yeah. So we have 35 minutes only. We we, we put together like a 50-minute set with, that had more of the songs from um, Viva La Cobra, but we're going to play more of the Viva La Cobra songs on the sideshow nice. the Thursday before. Cool. Yeah. We'll be there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we're fuck yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're there. We're, 
It's gonna be fun. So and what's, when this actually gets when this airs, you Cobra Starship will be announced as the headliner of Emo Night. Day. I know. Let's fucking go. <laughs> I didn't know we were the headliner. Yeah, you're yeah. headlining. Wait, cool. but how come we're playing outside if we're headlining? Is the whole the thing outside, outside is the main stage at the in in the parking yeah, lot of the Palladium. So we're building yeah. a, a big carnival outside in the parking lot of the Palladium. We're building a stage out there. We're gonna have like rides and games, Sick. and then inside we'll have uh, we're gonna do a 360 stage in the Palladium. So the DJ booth will be right in the middle, and we'll have like the Emo Night party in there. Oh, so show during the day and party inside. Is it gonna be like so game night? Like, emo you night, can kinda, night, Emo Night day. Yeah, Emo Night day. So yeah, it's it starts at. I don't know, 2. 2 p.m. ends at 10 p.m. And people can flow back and what forth. What time are we performing? At the end. At like 9? Yeah. Bro, it's going to be freezing in December in L.A. Dude, oh, you'll be fine. We did a I show last my, year. My, my, my fragile voice. I we did a show last year at the Torch at, on like December 17th, and it was it was nice. You're going to have like warmers on this stage? Dude, we're bro. recording this. You don't understand. On, I lose my uh, voice. When I try to sing when it's cold outside, my voice is just recording this some hot tea. October okay. 7th. And it was like a hundred degrees outside. Yeah, but you know, like after Thanksgiving hits in LA, it's just like boom, it's cold for like Maybe, three weeks. Or we'll get there. like fourth summer. All right, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what we'll we'll get do. you warmers. So we're headlining? Fuck. Yes. Wow, I didn't know that. Okay. Headlining. Let's go. What are your what are your standout <laughs> tracks? Like what are, what have you been enjoying playing? I, I've been loving paparazzi. Oh it's yeah. So fun, bro. Yeah. That song just has like so many different vibes in it. You know, it has like that Stevie Wonder riff that Patrick wrote. You know, it has a Latin mm -hmm. vibe, you know. So I like it, but it still feels like a punk rock song. And somehow, you know, it's weird. Morgan, what were your standouts? F3. Three. Three? What are they? F3. Guilty Pleasure. Mm -hmm. One Day Robots Will Cry. Wow. And Prostitution. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. Tell me. Sounds like Midtown songs. <laughs> <laughs> because you can tell, dude, you know, and it's also, you're like the, I, at least in, you know, I hadn't heard like a, you know, a breakdown, or whatever, what we would consider that, you know, like halftime in, you know, elect, electro or whatever you would consider Cobra to that style of music before Cobra. And oh. I was like, ah, oh, dude, it's like you, you hit it. You know, you hit Thank it you. for me. And so, and also just, you know, the choruses of those are really, you know, at least are very reminiscent of Midtown to me. Yeah, definitely prostitution. Yeah. Yeah. I love The City Is At War. I think that's an amazing opener. Um, Guilty Pleasure is fucking awesome as that's well. That's the song that's been stuck in my head all day. Yeah. Is there anything, when you listen to this album now or when you play it, you've mentioned it a little bit, like some of the lyrics here, like, uh, I don't know if I should be singing that. Is there anything like recording wise sonically that you're like, Oh, that's out of tune. Or like, I wish that we used a different sound on that. No, honestly, not on this album after. So what I was, t I didn't get to this part before, but you know, we were writing on the bus. I was writing with Patrick a bunch and then Patrick booked three weeks in Brooklyn with this engineer that he loved and I really, at, at his studio, some studio in Brooklyn, it was probably like, I think that's the best sounding record I've made. You know, like it sounds so good. My voice sounds great on that record. Um, and Patrick was just great in the studio. Like, so we really just like spent a lot of time on that, you know, especially versus the first one, there's like, like wrong notes being played in certain parts. I'm like, oh my God, how would let that through the door? But this one, we really were like pretty methodical on. What were those mm. days like when you were at Mission Sound in Brooklyn. Mission Sound, that's yeah. what it was. Like, huh. what what was the average day like you and Patrick in the studio? Well, it was it was all of us in the studio. It was really fun because like we hadn't been in like a real studio yet. Then as Cobra Starship, you know, mm. everything had been like home studios on the bus, whatever. So, and especially for the rest of the band, that was our first time. Like I had been in real studios with Midtown, but they hadn't. Um, so Ryland, I think, was just like in heaven. You know, just like layering vocals, layering harmonies. Like, you know, it was awesome. It was really cool just having it come together. I want to read you some Reddit quotes. Wow, here we go. Well, I'll just read you one. Read me the really go for one. it. Music are, are they good? You can read me all of them. I just don't go on because I don't want to see the bad stuff. You music know? Peaked, Too sensitive. Music peaked with Viva La Cobra. Everything oh, else wow. has been downhill since. Let's go. There you go. I'll just leave it there. There was a lot of good long ones. Sometimes I go into like these long things about how albums have changed people's lives. Wow. This one, like, I think it was a general consensus. You know, this album came out and this was a fun album. And people were like, what else could you want? Right? Like, what else could you want? And I think that that says a lot, right? It's fun. But here's the thing. I actually saw this, this, this one girl on TikTok who gave this whole exposition about why Cobra Starship is more punk rock than Midtown. And her premise was that 
um, Midtown, pers- it was emo, it was like personal introspective commentary, and Cobra Starship was actually societal commentary, which made it more punk rock. That's really smart. Yeah, it's a, it's a good take. It's a hot take. I actually it's- think that. So it's, it's a fun record, but there's a lot of, like you're saying, self-aware, there's a lot of like social commentary. It's a lot of commentary about like what's happening in culture at the time, what it was like, you know, also just like being in this world the fame, the party, the celebrity, but not being a part of it, you know? So like, like really observing it and and critiquing it from inside, but as someone who's an outsider. So I thought, I think like that's kind of like the premise. Did you, do you ever like, you know, read something like that or listen to something like that? And you're like, that wasn't the point at the time. And now it's changed, you know, you're like, I can see how it's gotta be so interesting to, to hear people have their takes on your lyrics and your songs when it's cool how things can change over time and mean different things and the songs and the lyrics that meant something then don't mean the same thing now, but they mean something else now. Yeah. I think in art in general, meaning is always found in retrospect. When you're making art, like you're really channeling, you're not really sure what you're channeling. And then most of the stuff that you're going to channel is going to be garbage. That's why people throw away like 90% of the stuff they create. But then those things that you keep, you're like, okay, I'm not sure what it is about it, but there's something that speaks to me here. And then in retrospect, you make sense of it. So for me, I actually, I wanted to meet that girl who did that because I'm like, wow, you're like, it's amazing because you're, you're articulating so well what I was feeling and, and couldn't articulate myself, you know? So you captured it better than I could capture it. And, and I met her and I think she was, she, she was, um, she was, nervous when I, <laughs> I was like, she she's like, why do you want to meet me? I'm like, dude, I don't know. You're just like really just captured, captured something, uh, you know, about like my history. You're just like historicized something I did. Yeah. She should listen to all these podcasts and hope she sees capture it. what I'm trying to say in all of the pod, all of the shit that I'm talking Someone about. Do do yeah. I'm telling, I'm really giving people gold. I just don't know how to say it. I think you're saying it great. I think it's all me. You just keep flowing. Don't worry about it. The worst you can do is try to analyze why you're flowing. Just flow, you know, analyze afterwards. I just wrote, I like a band that was formed by tripping balls. <laughs> like that's, but I'm just trying to find. I want to make sure. I really that think I get, of it more of a spiritual. Yeah, he doesn't quest, call it tripping; you know? it's medicine. Yeah, okay, it's medicine. I that's what, how quest. I wrote that. That's how I I wrote that. That's what I like. Okay. And actually, like the the last interview that you two did together, you guys went into that a lot. A lot of, a lot of ayahuasca talk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I I was like, he talks about this on every podcast, so I don't even want to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, no, yeah. I I just like went down my list of stuff. And I'm I like, feel like the that- only podcast I do are your guys's. I won't do podcasts. Yeah, I don't I don't do any podcasts, right? What else have I done? Yeah, we say that's a lot. We do too. Yeah. I've done um, you and I've done Finn McKinty. I just yeah, like Finn. doing people that, I, that I'm a fan of. You should do Shane Tolds. Who's that? The guy from Silverstein. He has a podcast oh, sh- called of course, Shane, yeah. Lead Singer Syndrome. It's really oh, good. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's he's an one. awesome interviewer. Okay. Yeah, really good guy too. Like we, I had a the podcast we did on that, I had to reel it back in afterwards because people were so passionate about it and I'd never really listened to them. What do you mean you have to reel it in afterwards? Yeah, I just never really listened to them. He was just them. like roasting like Canada and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I mean like for fun, <laughs> you know? And I had to go back and I had to like text Shane and be like, dude, he knows. But Shane knows. He's a great interviewer and he does a lot of great when research. When we're researching these podcasts, like we always listen to Shane's podcasts and interviews with people because he's oh, such a good interviewer. Interesting. If you like this, you might like that. What do you think people would like if they also like Viva La Cobra? Or what were you sort of influenced by musically when you were making this record? Justin Timberlake, Justified. Is that what his first album's called? Justified? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think it is. Gwen Stefani, uh, Love Angel Music Baby. First, first Gwen Stefani album. I'm going to say- Daft Punk. What else? I'll say one and you can tell me tell if me. it's yes or no. Chromeo. Oh, for sure. Yes. I didn't oh know if God. that was like- I, no, yeah, Chromio. The first session I did for Cobra Starship was with Dave One from Chromio. That's the I first Dave. session. Yeah, and and Ryland is like bros with him. He, they share a studio together. Yeah, yeah. I Chromio's used to run huge. Chromio's social media. No way. Yeah, that's sick. Yeah, like twenty fucking fourteen. Fourteen when 13. I met him. Yeah, when I yeah. met TJ. Was I mean, by the soldiers. way, that's exactly the thing I'm talking about. Like like Chromio and Cobra Starship. I mean, Chromio had an album I think called Hot Mess. Also, I think you know we're like yeah. very in very similar things. They were a little more of the indie of the indie sleaze, and maybe we were more of like the punk rock of 
if you're saying we're part of Indices, but like that's it what I'm did, saying. The that, term that didn't exist. Nobody said that. Then. What, I'm, what I'm saying is Dave. Uh, Dave <laughs> didn't go. Dave didn't go to like hardcore shows at VFW's. Garden. Right. Right. You know right. right. No. Yeah. 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 Like there have been times where people are like, "Oh, you should have Dave come DJ emo night." I'm like, he would not. He doesn't understand it. Yeah. 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 You know, and that's that's fine. But totally he, fine. Yeah. He's just not from that scene it, at but, all. But also like. A lot of people who go to Moonlight probably listen to Chromio, but not totally. everyone. You know, it's yeah. not universal. But there is, there's like, a, there definitely is a Venn diagram of like emo, hardcore, and indie sleuths. Or indie, I'm, I'm gonna, know. I'm gonna name a band that probably does all of those. Recover with Dan Keys, mm-hmm. bro. Yeah. Dan was supposed to be in Cobra Starship. He should have been. There is yeah. a big mistake. mistake. Back to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's always that's a, a whole, that's a whole long story. Yeah, uh, I, which Dan I, Keith, I love, love that guy, but I hate him. But I love him. <laughs> I mean, yes, I recover. I fucking love and Young Love. I love Young Love. Dude, yeah. I, I young know Love's I, a great song. I, I'm or the band, dude. It was like he had like a band that was like oh, uh, oh, when oh. I. I thought it was like an EP that he did, but Young Love was that second project. You're right. Yeah, and I that I, that was when I was like ripping music off off uh, off the internet, bro. In a lot of ways. Uh, Josh Madden sent me all this stuff. He like did a comparison, side by side comparison of the Dare and Young Love. Mm, yeah. Interesting. Like their videos, the look, everything. You yeah. mean STD sound system? <laughs> <laughs> that is so good. I saw that on Twitter. I have not heard that. That's amazing. <laughs> that but is that, genius. <laughs> all right, wow. Um, somebody's better put what I said oh. in the, the, a better way. Oh, I get it. Industry it. plan. I just got that. <laughs> like, what is going on over here? <laughs> what are you working on right now, Gabe? Uh, well, uh, right now I'm working on Brodeje, my bro. Okay, what is this? Okay, so basically, to sum it up, I'm going to do for my bros and their faces the same thing that Liquid Death did for water. That's my goal. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and actually, this actually goes back to Dan Keys, actually, you know, in a way. One time, uh, Dan Keys posted a photo on Instagram, of just like a selfie, and his lips were fucking so chapped. And so I was like, bro, haven't you ever heard of chapstick? And his response in the comments was like, yo, fucking chapstick and creams and that, all that shit's fucking f- losers. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like in the best Dan Keys voice you can yeah. say, like, you can just imagine that, like, fuck that shit. And so I feel like that's a mentality that a lot of our bros have um so you know i think part of the reason why i look not 45 is because i just religiously always use face cream and it wasn't even an expensive face cream it's like something i literally bought at cvs like a lot of dudes when they start getting to their 30s and stuff they're like fuck I, i'm like supposed to take care of my face what i do and then they go to keels and it gets complicated or it's expensive i mean you told me you buy 40 dollar face wash i'm embarrassed for you so <laughs> <laughs> i'm switching it up though i'm, I'm going bro you're going to protege you're going protege so yeah that that um is what i'm working on I, yeah so well that's why you asked me why i look so young also and that's like the only thing that I do. You have to moisturize, See, you know? only thing that but I do. But it shouldn't be complicated. Like, a lot of people are just like, oh, moisturizer, then like, you're going to want me to wash my face first and all this stuff. It's like, no, just like, just keep it very simple. Just like, once a day, put on moisturizer when you get out of the shower and that's it. What and, made you want to start taking care of your skin to begin with? Was it like a girlfriend who tipped you off? Was it like your parents oh, man i don't even know that i it might like i lived in new york and in the winters in new york if you don't fucking protect your face or something it just like your your skin will just start chapping you know like start start cracking so i just started having to put on moisturizer um and then the moisturizer if you want me to go deep on the story i was buying this like 15 dollar moisturizer from cvs and um it was good and what i didn't know is that it had this product called retinol in it like and i was using it every day and i think retinol keeps you young and then they discontinued the product and they repackaged it and they're selling it for 60 bucks in like a little pump now right so i'm just like this is bullshit and so i had like a bunch of them and i was like fuck it's like gold to me because then you know when a product gets discontinued you try to look it up on ebay or whatever it's like a hundred dollars i'm just yes. like what the fuck is going on and i'm just like why is it and then when i when i started like researching i'm just like oh it's, it's because of the retinol retinol is expensive i'm like is that it like and it became like this fad retinol is like a face cream fad or, you know or like I, I don't know if it's a fad or just like an ingredient that like people know really people start works. to know about it people start to know about it and it becomes more demand for it so they they like marked it up and, and around the same time so i started looking into that and around the same time liquid death was taken off literally because the guy was inspired from the tour that i was on when i was having to fucking drink the m- terrible warm monster energy drink cans filled with warm piss warm water at warp tour and he saw that and he's like oh i'm that's a great idea i'm gonna repackage that 
And my premise is why should my bros that like skate and go to shows have be drinking the same water that yoga moms are drinking? And I'm like, yeah, why should my bros be using the face cream that like, I don't know. And you've been working on it for a while though. Yeah, years. It takes years to get like FDA, trademarks, everything, you know. I've had the name Brodege for like, I've had that domain for probably 10 years. What is the development process like for something like that? Like, I, I know I've never made a product other than Bro, fucking printing it's t-shirts. It's such a fucking pain in the ass. First, you need to find a, uh, a lab that will do the, do the development. Okay. So I went through like finding a lab that can do development, can do manufacturing is complicated. Then if you want to have sunscreen in it, it has to have, you have to have a lab that has like FDA authorization and that's even more complicated. Then you actually have to develop it and go through it. And that takes like a year. So it took me like, I mean, I was looking for labs since like 2018, you know, so mm-hmm. finally, like it's really been the past three years that I found the lab and started working with it, but it just takes a while to just like get the product right. You know, a big part of it too is that like these labs are used to making like things that smell good and like, you know, I'm just like, I don't want any scents. I don't want to be greasy. I want to feel like you're not wearing anything. It's the third no scent thing today. Oh yeah? You've had a Scents are out this year. I'm just uh, like, I, I don't know. Like, I just don't <laughs> think dudes want, uh, I mean- uh, unless I could figure out how to get this, the scent of gasoline in a face cream, then maybe we're talking, <laughs> but like, you know, other than that, no. When you told us earlier, I think that there's like a true testament to, that you really stand behind it. And it's the fact that you've been working on it for so long. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, I know that I'll have an idea, be spazzed on it for like a month or two, and then it goes away. Right. And I'm like on to the next thing. And the fact that you've held on to this and continuously pushed for it to me as somebody who like has a lot. And I'm like, I want to do a lot that says something about it. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, people like you guys are artists also. So it's like, you know, you have ideas, not every idea is great. It's all great. When it first comes in your head, you're like, Oh, this is fucking sick. And then you got to think about it and think about the challenges. And you know, like, honestly, I didn't know, like this was one of many ideas I've had over the years. I didn't know if this one would come to fruition. And I had the idea before liquid death happened, but when liquid death happened, it's just like, okay, there's like clearly a market for this. Like people want products that speak to them made by people who are like them. You know, um, there's no reason why in today's world you should be having to buy things from huge corporations, faceless corporations that are just like, you know, we have everything so democratized that we can have high quality things with like, you can have high quality delivery, get things to you in like two days, you know, without having to be, you know, a huge company. I think it's fucking amazing. Thank you. I'm really proud of you. I think it's- Rodeo baby. You know, knowing you, knowing you, seeing the packaging, doing all this stuff, you're like, oh yeah, exactly. And it feels really good and it feels right. Thanks, like it, that, And that's, you know, when I look at a product or I look at a thing that people are putting out, I'm like, do all the dots, does this all connect? And you're like, here it is. And you're so excited about it. You're like, I've worked on this for so long. You see the way it looks. It's coming from it. Like all of it fits together. and. I like that. Thanks, man. I mean, it's, it's similar to being an artist because like when you're an artist, you want to make music that you and your friends want to listen to. That's like a big part of it. If you're making music that you think other people are going to like, but you don't love, it's never going to work. Yeah. So I just made something that I wanted, like literally the product that I wanted was not available anymore. So I made it myself, you know, and honestly, even better. That's what we always say about emo night too. Like we throw the party that we would want to go to, you know, and if we approached it any other way, like we're throwing a party to sell tickets. I don't think it would work the way that it works. Yeah. So it's great. Yeah. Brodage, because we're bros, not pros. You can use all these for ads on TikTok. <laughs> all day, bro. You cut this up. <laughs> I'm making I'm making my ad campaign right here on this emo. Yeah, I love it. CD right. burners. Well, Gabe, thank you so much for coming to my house and being in my studio with this annoying air conditioner and, and my being your mic cable. tech also yeah. it hasn't it hasn't crapped this out this is actually the first day that we have like the full setup like i built these curtains this like oh, backdrop sick. stand this weekend and like figured out how to mount this whole thing so wow i have one, one more question it. yeah go ahead outside of uh this genre and the genre that you know we kind of grew up and listen to i guess any actually any anything have you heard a song so good that you're like what F- how did i not Like, this is, how is this, this good? It doesn't have to be in this world. Like something that you just continuously go back to and you're like, fuck. Yeah, bro. I'm like, uh, you know, we're, we're going back to ayahuasca, but the ayahuasca, some of the ikoros in ayahuasca are unbelievable. And yeah, they're so good. I can sing some for you if you want, you know. The what? 
<laughs> they're, they're not songs. I, I feel back home with songs. They're not songs. They're not like a verse, chorus, bridge. And they're not really chants because there is melody. They're called Icaros. And what hat like they come to you and they're just no, no, no. The, these, these are, are like, like the, the healers are doing this. Yeah, these you? are these are like you know ancient. I, don't, I mean, I don't know ancient, wow. but it's a tradition. They're not really recorded. I mean, people you can find recordings of like people doing them, but they've never been like. These are just like it comes to. It's 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 beautiful because it's like a lineage. So every every you know uh, the the columns of ayahuascaros, which is also just like, but but the the healers they they come up with these melodies that come to them and they start doing it doing ceremonies and it changes every time and then you know their student learns it and then their student changes a little bit and then their student learns it and changes a little bit you know so my teacher is like he's he's amazing so he has um, just some amazing curves. What an interesting answer. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. Uh, it's not where I was going. I was gonna. Th- I thought you were gonna say like like a prayer by Madonna or something. <laughs> no, you know, uh, you can actually. I, there's actually a great one. You want to find it right now? There's, yeah. This one is actually from. There's a. There can I is, can I get it on Spotify? You can find it on YouTube. There's a, you find it on YouTube. You can look it up right now. There is a sect ayahuasca sect called Santa Daime, which is actually like in the 1800s. This guy that was working in the Amazon. You know, he was. I think he was working for like a rubber. F- uh, company, the company that was in the, like literally like extracting rubber from trees in the Amazon. And he was like the guard there and met these like indigenous people from a village, took ayahuasca with them, saw Jesus. So anyway, so these are actually in Portuguese. They're not in Quechua, which most of the ayahuasca songs are in Quechua. It's a gorgeous song. Oh, wow, long intro on this one version. Put it at 1.5. This version is very slow. So these are songs that have been, or not songs, but these are, have been passed down. Yeah, I think the song was written by the, the maestro. I forget what his name is, Maestro or something, but. And they're. This is like a. I, um, it's in like the same, right? it's like, the, like same scale as like all. It's like an emo song. Oh, yeah. It's it, I, I, like, I'll play it for you. It's an emo song. Yeah, it's gorgeous. You know, you said about uh, hot water music. I feel that way about the Misfits. Like oh, if you, interesting. If you, yeah. If you like took their melody and you made that into like an actual song. Like, I feel like it's, it would be so beautiful. It's weird. I never really was into the Misfits. I'm from Jersey. I just was not into the Misfits. It's yeah, it's thing. strange that I am. Yeah. It's strange. It's like a strange one for me. I think I just really like like punk. I wanted, to, I wanted to like punk rock so much. And a lot of it, like the really hard punk stuff, didn't speak to me. I was like a big Ramones fan, big like Screeching Weasel fan. But I just, the Misfits were just like that. Or I don't know why. I just didn't. Maybe because of, it felt like too commercialized for me at the time. I have no idea. Why. I have no idea why I just was not into it. I just, I they just, were like on their own Island too. That's another thing, you know, it's that's when you said that about hot water music, I was like, that's the way that I feel about those guys. You should make an album of misfits covers. I, I literally think that some of the stuff is so could be so beautiful. And I've tried to find people covering it. Mm. And there's only like a couple of couple of them that are done. Not great, huh. but there's, it's really beautiful. I'll send you the I'll send you the one song where I'm like, slow if you did this, this is beautiful. All right. I just found a jazz version of Holla Back Girl, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you really? Yeah, it's really good. We're gonna do we're gonna do that at the show, but we don't have enough time. That's how we're gonna do a Holla Back Board jazz version, get a Vegas lounge singer. Oh my god. Know. Can you do that? At, show, can you do that sideshow? What? Do that sideshow. Maybe we can do the sideshow. Dude, you should get fucking um uh-huh. what's that fucking guy's name? Who? What's that guy's uh, Neil Ham? Uh, not Richard Neil. Cheese. Richard Cheese. You ever seen this guy? Yes, yes, yeah. I heard that guy. Yeah. Who's that? He's like a lounge singer that does uh, like lounge covers. Well, I'm fired. Oh, I'm fired oh, as you check, bro. I really thought it's it was my fault. fault. I mean, you did it. The you did it for most of it. So oh, it's because like, you were fucking putting your yeah. computer on it. Richard Cheese, Chop Suey. <laughs> oh, amazing! Is he in Vegas? Yeah. I, I don't know, would, but he's. I would think. Why'd you leave the keys upon the table? You wanted to. 
That's Why amazing. Did you leave the keys upon <laughs> That's the table? amazing, bro. Dude. And he's like a great exactly. That's probably like the worst one. Just one. That's great, bro. Dude, dude his his uh That's great. It's bro. awesome. It's really good. It's yeah, really, yeah, good. really good. You should see what it'll Okay. So you should see what you should see what she's all right. Yeah. We got all right, we got to go. Show. We're breaking the whole the whole all the whole. Right, the whole right. so it's falling apart. apart. Yeah, and it's this is like my maybe the longest podcast we've done. Really, Gabe? So, thank you for being here. Thanks for having Thanks, me, guys. Dude. First first time in the new studio. I appreciate it. I honestly could do this. This I could I could do this for like three more hours with you. Let's go, and then we'll go shooting. All right. <laughs> all right, everybody. <laughs>